Hey watercolor wizards, Harsha here. Today I'm gonna to be talking about all sorts of different brushes, the different types that I have and how to use them. So let's start with the hockey brush and this brush is sometimes called a hake brush but I think it's hockey. It is actually made out of some soft goat hair and it's really, really soft and floppy. And now this will lay down washes very softly and without disturbing under layers, which is what you want. It does also hold a huge amount of water. So this is sort of ideal for large flat washes of color or later top glazes where you need to put in a lot of water. You can also use it to soak up water or extra paint off of the paper because it really is really high in absorbency. So there are a few other variations of a large wash brush for us to look at. So the hockey brush is really soft and can lay down big washes of water and glaze really quickly. You also have something like this Cotman wash brush. They're both one inch wash brushes. The Cotman synthetic wash brush has got a, a sharper profile. It's thinner and narrower so you can lay down sharp edges in a wash better. And also it has synthetic hairs instead of natural goat hair so it'll hold less water. It'll give you a nice chiseled edge if you use it right along its tip and you can carve out outlines and stuff. And you can also go and get a nice large flat area with it. Every brush has its own unique dry brush effect look and this one gives you a nice sort of wood grain. It would be good for like the side of a wood paneled wall or a trunk or something. Again, this one is narrower, holds less water and can give you more chiseled edges and this one is more for softer glazing and for large amounts of water drop off or pick up. This is also a one inch wash brush but this is also a blending and glazing brush and it's by Sterling Edwards and it's not made out of soft synthetic hair or out of soft natural hair like this goat hair. This one's made out of hog bristle. This is a lot tougher and what you can do with this is you can use it to blend edges, scrape and blend edges with it, even dry edges. So if this is a dry edge here because this is bristle, I can use it to blend those right out. It's very useful for landscapes and very useful for blending and glazing out really large areas and giving them cool effects. You can make it really wet and use it as a glazing brush just like the other two wash brushes. And when used more dry brush, you can see that it can be used for foliage type marks and other sort of textural things that you can do with it. It's really quite cool. Smaller than the one inch wash brushes, I also have a mop brush. And this one has a color shaper end of it, which you can use for masking fluid or for scraping through or applying thick paint. And it's just sort of just a textural effect silicone tip. Not really a brush, but if you have any color shapers, you know you can use them for oils, acrylics, pastels, or for certain effects in watercolor. And so this side I think is just a squirrel hair mop. And now the mop is sort of like a wash brush, but instead of coming in a flat shape, it comes more in sort of a soft round shape. I've got other brushes that are similar to this mop. A three quarter inch black velvet oval can be used for washes, but instead of having a flat chisel tip, it's got this nice sort of pointed type tip on it. And this one is also an oval wash brush and you can see the difference. This oval is softer. So even when it's wet, it doesn't quite point as much as this one. These are both oval washes, but the different makes and companies can have slightly different oval washes. Again, you can apply a large wash with this very quickly because it holds a huge amount of water. So if you don't have the one inch wash, this is great. This mop brush because it's squirrel and also because it's got such a round belly, separates much better. So it'll give you some really nice dry brush effects. If you separate out the hairs at the top and then go along and paint some foliage, it's really, really good for that. Very easy. Anything like foliage or fur, you can do that. You can also poke around with all of your brushes and sort of stipple them on the paper and make all sorts of different effects. All of your brushes can dance like this. So depending on the shape of the brush, the footprint will be different, but basically you have the brushes shape when you sweep it down, you've got a dry brush effect and you've got the dancing stippling random effect. And you can do that with all of your brushes and all of your brushes will give you a slightly different look. Again, when it's wet, you can see how it has a round full belly and it comes to a pointed tip. So if you're applying this paint, you can really apply it in a smaller area or you can apply it in a larger area by squashing this down and it'll can become more like a wash brush. Okay, here's the half inch oval wash brush. It's synthetic, so it gives you more control over your paint. It carries less water, so automatically it'll give you a more intense color look because with this one, you carry so much water that in order to get more intense pigment, you have to make sure you really take out the water out of the brush. So this one's a little bit more controlled and it does have sort of a filberty tip to it. 
And so as a result of that, you've got some control with blending. This is gonna be a nice blending brush too. Anytime you get anything that's a filbert or a flat, you can use it to blend out edges. So if I wanted to come back here and just get some water, I can then blend out this edge. And I've got a lot more control over it than I would if I was using a floppier brush. Filbert or an angular or a flat will all work really well for blending out edges. This floppy, natural hair brush is not as good of a choice because it's so soft that it's great for laying down color and washes and glazes and, and water. You can do a little bit of a scrubby action with them. It's not that it's not possible and that it doesn't give you a nice cool edge. It just is harder on this brush and also on top of that it's less control. So you can of course be more delicate about it but I just feel like if I did this all the time with this mop brush it really would ruin this nice natural hair versus doing it with a synthetic. So it's up to you. You can blend with your synthetics and your naturals. I just choose not to blend with my naturals if I can help it. So I'm not going to show you the three-quarter black velvet oval, but it's gonna be very similar to using either of these two brushes. This is an oval wash and this is an oval wash, but this one is more pointed because it's from a different company, so it depends on the make. It looks more like a cat's tongue brush than it looks like an oval wash, but there is a fine line between oval, filbert, and cat's tongue, depending on what company you get them from. So these are sponges, they're not technically brushes, but they fall into a paint application category. So I just wanted to show you that if you have a sponge, and this is a natural sponge, this is a synthetic sponge, they'll give you different effects. You can use them to apply water or paint textural shapes for something, and this works great for a quick natural foliage, better than what you can get with a brush, and also it'll give you great sea foam, great texture in a rock. So with a synthetic piece of sponge here that I have cut out, you can cut it out in a wedge and really just use it to apply sharp looking shapes to the paper. If you use it at an angle, you can also use it to apply spongy textural effects as well. As long as you don't put it on the angled edge, it can look pretty natural too. It's been cut out like this, you can actually use it to apply paint and a wash and dry brush on. So whether, if you have a lot of water, it'll go on in a glaze. If you don't have that much water, then you can have cool streaky dry brush effects. And that's all dry brush means. It means you have so little water involved and more paint that it gives you a streaky textural effect depending on the shape of whatever you're dragging along the paper. And last, and in this case least, <laughs> I have got this incredible nib, which I don't really like that much, but you can use it to apply masking fluid or ink or paint. And it works very much like a marker felt tip. And it works better with ink because ink is not in a pan. So if you've got wet watercolor, you sort of have to make sure it's wet enough to give you a mark. And it's sort of more dependable because you can push down and the tip doesn't change, unlike a brush where the tip varies depending on how hard or soft you push down on something. So if you wanna get like something very specific in like ships rigging or some kind of electric pulls, and maybe you wanna use this, but I don't really like that even after I've shaved this down with an X-Acto knife, that this is how thick the tip is. I don't really like it this thick. I would like it to be finer if I really wanted it for a straight line application, but that is an option. And the other side of it, it had a flatter tip, but I sort of cut it off and turned it into a round pointed tip on the other end too. So, and you can also use it to lift up paint as well. So I've got that wet and I'm using it to lift up paint. And you can do that with any of your brushes. Just starting to get a little bit tired of this green, but that's okay. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you probably the most common brush you might see for watercolor, which is just a round brush. I'm showing you a brush that's round, it's not flat at the base, down to a tip. Now depending on if it's an old or new brush, natural or synthetic, or what the make is, it'll come to different kinds of points, but that's basically what a round brush looks like. The great thing about a brush is, is if you push down and then pull up, you can get nice teardrop shape strokes instead of just a flat line with no dimension. And it's pretty versatile because you can use it for a thinner line and if you've got more paint in your brush then you can sort of put it down flat and get in a large area and even hold it down on its side. You can hold any brush on its side and get a dry brush effect. You can hold any brush on its tip and let the water run out and get a dry brush effect. You can make any brush dance and do a random textural effect. And it'll look different for the different shapes of brushes, but those are things you can do with any brush. And then the actual shape of the brush will make it better and worse at certain things. So I've got a deer foot brush here dipple on texture like this. Now, of course, if you dragged it along the page, you can also use it to apply paint in a straight on flat glaze shape. 
But the point of it is, because you've got lots of brushes to do that, that because this has this hoof shape at the bottom of it, hence the name Deerfoot, that you can go ahead and speckle with it like this. Now, if it's wetter, it'll give you dots like that, but if you get nice dry paint in there, eventually it'll start to give you more of a texture that looks like foliage or anything else that you wanna turn it into that's textural. Mottled spots on rocks, uh, speckles in eggs, that's what you can use a Deerfoot brush for. So the Deerfoot's kissing cousin is the stencil brush. So this is just a fabric stencil brush that you can use to stencil on paint, but it's the same thing as if you have a stencil or a masking frisket film, you can also use this to just sort of pounce in the paint over the top of it. So if you had something like a stencil and you had super thick paint or gouache, you could stencil in the paint over it like this instead of brushing it on. That lets water leak underneath the stencil, but just sort of pouncing it on like this in a drier paint would make the paint just stay where the stencil is. Stencil or pouncing brush, Deerfoot brush, kissing cousins. Here's a miniature fan brush. I, it's just a 20 over zero to go with the miniature painting set. I also have slightly larger fan brushes, but I just thought this one was so darn cute, I had to get it. And if it's dry brush, of course the palm fan is obvious, but it does look rather contrived, but it does give you great streaky looking effects if you want. If you make it dance, then you can do far less contrived looking textures, and then they look way more random and it sort of hides the shape of the brush, which makes it look more natural. So you can do that for some awesome foliage. For watercolor, it's much more of an effects brush, and it's, you're better off using other brushes for blending edges, but if you're an oil painter, you can also use a thicker fan brush to blend out and smooth out edges and sort of smush out clouds and stuff. So here's my silver black velvet oval, and here's my Simmons oval wash. And you can see the filbert is basically kind of like a miniature version of this oval wash brush. Tapered, soft oval at the end of it that is great for blending, especially if it's a synthetic brush. It's really great for blending. It's very similar to a round, a bit more control because it's got a shorter barrel. But where it really comes in is if I wanted to blend out any of these edges, then I can come back with a damp, clean filbert brush and I can do a little circular motion for a dry area and it'll give me a nice blended edge. Or I can come to a wet area that's recently wet and just sort of take some water and a damp brush to it and it'll blend that edge out for me. And of course, if you keep going, you get a disappearing edge there. But this is really great for that because there's so much control in it. Having that shorter length and also not a super full and wide belly makes it not floppy, which allows you to get the blended edges in control. And again, you can lift paint with this too, and it'll be good for that because it gives you nice control. You can press against the paper. And I've cut this brush much smaller so I can go travel painting with it, but this is actually, of course, comes in a full size, and that's what it looks like if it's dry brushing. And again, you can dry brush with any of your brushes. Do this random dance to get that textural look, but you'll get that kind of look versus with a fan brush, you get that kind of dancing brush look versus a stippler or a deer foot or a stencil brush. So every brush dances a little bit differently, just like a person. If you have any flat brushes like this one, then they are either gonna be called a flat brush or depending on the length of the bristles, it might be a bright or it might be a one stroke. But for all of them, you'll have a flat ferrule and flat bristles or hair at the end. So you can make lovely, completely flat horizontal strokes with a flat brush. If you love painting geometric shapes or shapes with flat edges, if you want to get a brush that's very predictable, then sometimes a flat or angle brush is a better idea because you can get more predictable strokes. So again, you can hold this brush up on its tip, just like you can get a really fine line with a round, you can get a fine line with a flat one stroke or a bright by holding it up on its tip and getting a fine line like that. And you can do the same thing with a round. You can hold a round on its tip and do little lines with it too. So it all depends on how you're holding your brush. But some people do find a flat more comfortable because a round can be more unpredictable and at a corner, you have to sort of hold it like that versus with a flat or an angle, you can just go like that. And it makes a nice edge with a round. You just have to have a different type of hold on it. So it all depends on what kind of brush you're comfortable with, what you wanna do. I like to have both angles, 
flats and rounds around. I think my favorites to use are sort of filberts and angles at this point because they can do such deft edging. It'll eventually start to give me some dry brush effects. But you can see how the mop was so much better for that because it holds a spread out shape much better. And the dancing random texture that you can do with all of your brushes. All right, so I showed you the shorter filbert at some point, and here is a pointed filbert. And they're very similar to each other, except for this one has a softer edge and this one is pointier. So you can use this one to do detail work. The round brush is round all the way around. This pointed filbert has a flat ferrule, flat where the hair is, but when it comes to the tip, it's actually coming to a rounded point. So you can go ahead and do some nice, really fine effects with this. This is brand new, this one. And there's a lot of control here, again. A flat base will give you more control than a round because a round can splay out and bend in different directions. So a pointed filbert will still give you more control than a round. The filbert itself is kind of a child of the round and the flat. And so the pointed filbert is like the child that looks more like the round, <laughs> basically. If you want to lay it down on its side, it'll give you nice paint coverage for a large area. It does make some nice dry brushing, just like the mop. It's got a nice tip that can splay into And the angle brush is kind of like a flat brush in that it has a flat base or ferrule, so it does not have a round base. It's got a flat base where the hairs are fitted in, but instead of being cut flat, it's cut at an angle. So this does give you more precision in where you can apply a line. For me, the angle sits more comfortably in my hand than a flat because I feel like it's at the natural angle that my hand is at versus the flat. And you can also use it for little tiny corners and you can also use it for blending out edges, just like a filbert. So it works good for all of those things. Get rid of the paint of the brush, clean it out so it's just damp. And then I could come back and I could blend out an edge with just some water. And it gives you some nice blended effects there. You can do calligraphy with a an angle brush too because it's just the same shape as your nib basically. So you can see that it gives you just the right angles. So I used to do calligraphy when I was younger. And I've shown you an angle brush and I've shown you the flat brush and I've also shown you a filbert and I've also shown you a pointed filbert. Well, What's left that's sort of kind of like them <laughs> is a, a dagger brush. Okay, so a dagger brush also has a flat base. It, these are the two round based brushes that we've looked at so far, a mop and then a round. And they both have a round base and then they taper to some kind of a point. The angle, the flat, the filbert, and the pointed filbert all have flat bases, but they come to different tips. So, and a dagger is kind of like an long angle brush. I've got an eighth of an inch and then I also have a larger dagger which is a quarter of an inch and it's fuller in the belly and it's by a silver black velvet. And I would use these much more for wash brushes because I do feel like it having a full belly and being this long, there's not that much control. You get a lot of control with the angle or the filbert and even with the flat, but you don't get very much control with the dagger is what I found. So here's my dagger that is the larger one by a silver black velvet. And of course you can do lovely washes with it. It holds a huge amount of water and paint. This is a synthetic and squirrel mix. And if I wanted to do a line that's coming out, I can actually do a pointy line if I wanted. But I feel like because I'm balancing it at the very end of that long angle, that it's just a lot harder to control over time. And if I change the angle of my brush, this point is harder to control in different movements than if I had a shorter bellied brush. And that's the real difference between a dagger brush and a shorter round or a shorter angle, a proper angle brush. This kind of angle brush has more control just because the length of the hair is shorter. But this is still a fun brush to have. Should I use mine more? I just don't because I feel like it's usually a little bit too floppy for me to deal with when I'm doing something that's complicated because I feel like the hair flops around too much. So I think even, I mean, it gets this like 
turning about look to it that is really floppy that I don't really find happens with even my rounds or my mops. Okay, so this smaller dagger with a lot of paint in it, again, can give you a nice shape filling in small wash type area brush. So it has like a, basically a large angle that you can push down on the paper and do that. So I like that, it's very comfortable. And being smaller and less floppy, it actually has more control. So you could give you fine lines at the tip of the dagger and broader lines if you push down and then really broad lines if you use the angle of the dagger. So it's a nice versatile brush. It's like angle brushes, but cut much steeper. So it will give you a wider range of angle and tip and stroke when it comes to the wash, but you do lose a little bit of the control that you would get as a blending edge. All right, so here is a script liner brush. It's also called a rigger or a liner, and it is a very long round. So basically the other rounds that I showed you so far were the mop that has a round base and it comes to a pointed tip, and also just a smaller round that is a round base and comes to a pointed tip. So a script liner or a liner or a rigger brush is basically just a really long and narrow round brush. Round base, long length of hair, really narrow and comes to a pointed tip. Nice long line. Unlike the dagger, it doesn't change width. So it's more predictable in how you can control it for a long line. So you can use it for really cool long lines. And the reason it's called a rigger is people are doing ship or boat paintings. You can do long lines with this and it's great. You can also, like I said, use it for handwriting, doing long straight lines, curved lines, handwriting. So the last round based brush that I'll show you is this tiny spotter. This is a 20 over zero. And this is for doing teeny tiny lines and areas. So you can do the highlights and eye of somebody that you're painting really small or basically little tiny embellishments and highlights. They work really well with this. You can also do lines with this the way that you that I've done with the liner. And the difference is that this won't hold as much paint. So it's just got the teeniest tears, but I've used it for lining as well, especially if I'm doing something where I feel like it's a miniature piece or not a very large piece. You can definitely just do a lot of lining with this too. Yeah, the liner just holds way more paint. You can never do this many strokes with a, a little tiny spotter. It's a scrubber that is a half inch flat and then another scrubber which is a says size four, but it looks really teeny and it's just like a filbert shaped scrubber. So it has more of an oval tip. Both of them have flat bases. You can use both of these when they're clean and damp to lift out some paint by scrubbing on paper and it'll scrub the paint right up. Because they're really sort of harsh on the paper, you have to be careful not to tear up too much of the paper. But if you want to save an area that's gone too dark or take out some final highlights, this is a good way to do that. Just agitates using the synthetic bristles and they're really hard versus soft bristles and they sort of just agitates the paint and lifts it up. You, you can also look to the back of your brush and see if any of your brushes have a little flat edge like this and you can use it to emboss into the paper to make a hard line and the paint can collect there. You can use the back of the brush to do this before or after you paint something and you can also sharpen your brush with a pencil sharpener at the back end and it'll give you this sort of sharp tip to go add some paint in. It'll collect in the, in the areas where you did that pushing. So that embossing will collect paint. Do a quick recap of the different kinds of brushes I showed today because there really were so many. So first we'll do the non-brushes and that's these sponges. And I said there was natural and synthetic and you can use them for textural effects or to apply large amounts of water or a glaze. They will work if you soak them in. This incredible nib, that's, it's like an empty felt tip marker that you can soak into ink or paint or masking fluid and apply it that way. You can also apply a masking fluid using not just the incredible nib, but the silicone color shaper blending tip, or you can also use the back of a brush. And speaking of the back of brushes, I mentioned that you can sharpen up the back of a brush or buy brushes that have angles at the back of them. And you can use all of those to indent into the paper to collect paint and get certain effects with that too. So that's the 
non-brush parts of what I showed and and the non-paint brush brushes. We also talked about scrubber brushes, which are great for fixing mistakes, lifting out highlights and sort of carving out a light spot, but it is hard on the paper. This is a one inch hockey brush, a synthetic Cotman brush, and also this one inch Sterling Edwards brush. Now these brushes are all different from each other. They can all be used for washing and for glazing, but, but this is board bristle, so it's tough and you can use it to blend out edges and scrape paint up. You can use this one because it's very chisel to lay down corners and edges really nicely. And you can use the hockey one to splay out the hairs and do textural effects that look like grass or fur. And also just to soak up paint because it can soak up so much water. So there's different kinds of wash brushes. I also have the smaller wash brushes that come in an oval shape. Even with the oval, I was talking about how some of them can be more pointed or less pointed. And they again are lying in a flat base. And these are great for laying in washes and also for blending. The mop brush was similar to these oval brushes, except for that it came to more of a point. It's a natural hair. You can also splay it out really well and do some great fur or grass effects with it. You can splay out any of your brushes and do effects with them, but make sure you're careful not to do that with really fine pointed brushes because you could ruin the tip. And also you can make any brush sort of dance on the paper and do random effects with it, which I suggest you can do with your your more sort of tough brushes. So with the effects brushes, you can have a deer foot brush, you can have a fan brush, and you can also have a stencil or a stippler brush. A fan brush, if you're using it for oil or acrylic and it's thicker, can also be great for fanning out and blending out edges, but otherwise for watercolor, it's great for sort of textural effects. And the deer foot, just like the stippler and stencil, has this great flat bottom that is great for pouncing on paint through a stencil or a mask. And so we come to the most common brush, like I mentioned before, was the round brush. So the round brush has a round base and it comes to a pointed tip and you can have a sort of run of the mill round that gives you a nice pointed tip and can also be used on its side or pushed down to get a wider stroke. And so here's a more expensive round that has a finer tip because it's for watercoloring botanicals. It's a size four by Billy Shoal. And the really long narrow one is the one that's called a script liner or a rigger. And that can be used for long thin lines and handwriting, very useful for really thin lines. And if you want really tight, detailed, tiny areas, then you can use your spotter and you can put in, as the name implies, dots, or you can put in little tiny lines. That's a detail round brush. And you can do some of the same point work with a spotter that you can do with a liner. The difference is, is that a liner or a rigger can carry more paint and give you a more fluid long line than a spotter can. So those are the different kinds of round brushes. So you can have a flat brush, which gives you a great geometric line and it's very easy to control. And for a lot of people, it's a more natural choice than the round, even though the round is much more common. Flat brush may also be called a one stroke or a bright, depending on the length of it. Brights tend to be shorter. They're almost squarish. And one of my favorites, which is an angle brush, and it's basically a flat brush that has a, an angular haircut. It can give you a thin line, a thick line, nice angled calligraphy line, useful for lots of things like blending. And if you wanna have a rounded oval brush that's lying in a flat base, that would be a filbert and the pointed filbert. And somewhere in between, you would have something that's more like a cat's tongue. So this larger brush is more like a cat's tongue shape. And then you've got the dagger, which I said was a more extreme angle brush. So it's basically an angle brush that's living on the edge because it has a much steeper angle. You do get less control, but you also get a wider stroke when you lay it down on its side. Those are all the different types of brushes I discussed today. Hopefully you learned something about how to use all of them. And again, you can make every brush do a lot of different things. So make sure you smush it down and make it dance and also use it dry brush and use it at an angle and straight up and down to get the full effects of any brush. If you have a pointed brush, like a script liner or a spotter or a really sharp round that you don't smush it down too much because you're going to lose the tip and leave your smushing and dancing for your other brushes. If you dry it facing up, not really good for it. It splays out the hair and it makes the water go into the ferrule and it expands the wood and it sort of loosens the glue. If you dry it flat, that's pretty okay. It's fine if you don't have any other option. And if you dry it hanging so the tip is down, that's the best for it because it keeps that water that's running out and drying completely away from the ferrule and the base of the brush. That's my tip on drying brushes. When it comes to storing them, you can store them flat inside of your art supplies drawer. And if you are getting a brush that has some hairs pointing in the wrong direction, if you just get some gum Arabic on it or get a little bit of conditioner on it, then it'll help it dry that way. If you have some gum Arabic sitting around, that's the easiest fix. 
If you do want to protect your brushes with this kind of cover, a little bit of conditioner or gum arabic in that brush so that it's shaped before you put the little funnel back on because you don't want the little hairs being pushed backward. That's the main thing. If you can't do it, then skip the little plastic cover. Another option is to get these little brush covers that are made out of this mesh plastic and you basically slide them on from the back of the brush. Do not slide them on from the front of the brush. You go from the back and you stop when it's covering the tip. You can even put that on before the brush is fully dry because this is a webby mesh. It lets the air go through. Putting it on, just make sure you put it on from the back so it doesn't pull the hairs backward. And when you're pulling it off, don't pull it backward. Pull it off so that you're pulling it off the front. For most of my brushes, I just lay them flat in a drawer and don't move them around so they don't really need that kind of protection. You can also get a brush roll for traveling or storing. Again, thanks for parking your brushes here. Please comment, like, and subscribe, and check out my website link in the description below. And until next time, wishing you magical paint brushing adventures.